Hello, museum families, and welcome to RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world, and back in time millions and millions of years ago today. So the previous sessions are recorded and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. My name is Chris O'Connor and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum um, and my home is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I'm an uninvited guest on this territory and grateful to live, learn, and raise a family on this land. So dinosaurs. Even just saying the, the word makes us all lean forward. There's a mystery, a puzzle about them that engages our imagination. What would it be like to look out my window right here and see a dinosaur munching on those leaves? What about hearing a roar from all the way over at Beacon Hill Park a few blocks away? Very exciting, maybe a little bit scary, but very exciting. Um, and what we, but what we know about dinosaurs is what we learn from fossils. And our guest today is our fossil superstar here at the Royal BC Museum, Dr. Victoria Arbor. Arbor. But before we begin, I just want to go back to um, our session last week. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So, oops. So RBCM at home. Can you see that? Great. So last week we had a session with a fantastic uh, home learning family in, in Victoria here, Sky, Franny, and Rupert. And they talked about alternative school supplies. So in addition to pencils and books, there's also things like perspective and positivity and flexibility. So how do we use those, those values and virtues to help support our learning? Um, so that was last week. This week we'll be making, we did, we made some art last week, but um, we'll be making um, more art this week. We'd love to see the dinosaurs that you make. So please, please, please share with us because both Victoria and I would be like so thrilled to see what you come up with. So um, my, you can send it to me directly, C-O-C-O-N-N-O-R at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca. You could share it through our social media channels here at the museum at Royal BC Museum or hashtag RBCM Kids. Keep exploring. We have lots of things, that, lots of dinosaur related things on our learning portal. So if you Google learning portal on Royal BC Museum, it will come up and you can search for those things. Um, so definitely do that if you can. And then next week is um, Orange Shirt Day. So uh, it's a day to give um, to remember uh, residential schools and the legacy and, and the harm done through residential schools. Um, and Eddie Charlie and Kristen Spray, who uh, really led the, le led the organizing around Orange Short Day here in Victoria. They're, I'm really grateful that they're going to be uh, spending the session next week with us and letting us know about uh, Orange Short Day. So definitely, um, Get your orange shirt and then join join in uh, next Wednesday uh, at 11 o'clock. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing. I'm going to come back to. OK, so in this uh, format, you could see me, your host, uh, and also our special guest. And today we have Victoria. Though we can't see you, we can hear from you if you use the Q&A box uh, in chat in the or chat in the in zoom or if you're on facebook live the comment section and our colleague kim uh is looking at the facebook live feed and will uh bring questions over to the zoom chat so we could we could see them uh so feel free to ask questions as we go along um and and i'll we'll we'll answer them or victoria will answer them as as we go along and heads up we'll be doing some making today so you'll need um some kind of clay or um, Play-Doh or plasticine or um, whatever you whatever you can mold with, some dried pasta and or beads or buttons. Um, so, but if you don't have any of that, don't worry about it. You can come back. We'll, we're recording this, so you can come back to this uh, later uh, at our RBCM uh, YouTube page. So let's 
let's get into it. So let's meet our special guests. Um, if, you, if you are a regular to RBCM at Home Kids, Dr. Victoria Arbor needs no introduction. <laughs> our curator of paleontology, pale, paleontology has been a guest two times already, and this third appearance is unprecedented. We have not had any guest on for three times, but what a perfect guest to have three times on, Dr. Victoria Arbor. Um, and you are the curator of paleontology. So what exactly does that mean, Victoria? Yeah, so I'm the curator of paleontology, which means that I help look after the fossil collection and I do research, I study the fossils in the collection, and then I also talk about it to people like the people who are tuning in today. So that's kind of what a curator does. Um, paleontology covers the whole history of life in the fossil record. So I study dinosaurs, and I think dinosaurs are what most people think of when they think of paleontology, but you can be a paleontologist who studies plants or insects or mammals or fish or all kinds of different things all at the same time. Um, so it's not just dinosaurs, it's anything in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. But you have a particular fondness for, for, for dinosaurs. Right. I do. I really like studying dinosaurs. I was a little kid who really liked dinosaurs and I never really grew out of my dinosaur phase. So I count myself pretty lucky that I get to spend my days thinking about dinosaurs and then sharing the things that I learned with everybody else. So when we're talking about fossils here at the museum, it, it could be as small, like very small or just something that's very large. What's the sort of range of sides of specimens that you you work with here? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the fossil collection, we have um, tiny little insects that are only a couple of millimeters long. We have things that are actually even smaller. We have fossil pollen that you can't even see unless you look at it under a microscope. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have things all the way up to mammoth tusks or big, big ammonites, these big shell sea creatures that look a bit like a, a nautilus or like a squid in a shell. Um, we have a big marine reptile called an ichthyosaur in the collection. What we don't have yet is like a really big dinosaur. So we have a little dinosaur named Buster, uh, mm -hmm. but we don't have a big dinosaur yet. So we're, uh, that's, I'm going to hopefully add one of those to our collection eventually. Yeah, I have all the faith in the world in you, Victoria, <laughs> to find that and, and bring that into the collection. Um, so today we're, we're going to be looking specifically at armored dinosaurs. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, armored dinosaurs, those are my very favorite group of dinosaurs. So um, when you are training to become a paleontologist, you do a couple of university degrees, you do an undergrad degree, then you do something called a master's and a PhD. And so when I started my master's degree, I was really interested in looking at armored dinosaurs. These are uh, dinosaurs called ankylosaurs. And I got very interested in them because they have tail plugs. I'll just point out, I have a picture of one on my shirt, so you've always have a reminder during this presentation of what I'm talking about. Um, so they're very spiky dinosaurs, and some of them have this really cool tail club, and I was really interested in that, and then I basically did my whole PhD looking at all the different species of ankylosaurs and how they're related to each other and how they've moved around on the planet through time, um, and I still do a lot of work on them, uh, and now I sort of look at bigger picture questions about how animal armor has evolved and especially how animal weapons have evolved. Uh, mostly thinking about ankylosaurs, but also looking at other armored and weaponed animals um, that are around today and in the fossil record. Hmm. So that's, that's really thinking not just in terms of the shape and look and feel of them, but also in terms of behavior. Right. Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about behavior. So some of the things that I did were looking at um, how they use their tail clubs to smash things. So I basically did a lot of very fancy math to figure out how hard an ankylosaur could smash its tail into something. And I also look at how tails evolved through time um, and why more animals today don't have uh, weapons on their tails, for example. Hmm. So some of it is like really fun and you work with fossils most of the time. And other things are a little bit more mathy and a little bit more like philosophical or conceptual and you have to do a lot of like weird statistics um, but they're both really fun and both approaches are really important for learning about ancient life. Yeah and I'm also thinking because this week is actually science literacy week um, so that that idea of like evidence that you could actually see but then also things that you have to like imagine or like make some guesses of what what might have been. Uh, yeah and one of the fun things about paleontology is that um, 
you get to do a lot of time imagining, and then you have to try to figure out if what you imagined is probable, like if it's possible, if you actually have any evidence for it. So I spend a lot of time coming up with ideas and then figuring out how I can say that those ideas are wrong. It sounds really weird, but you sort of like, you come up with an idea and then you try to like tell yourself that it's wrong. So you don't sort of try to show that it's right. You try to like cross things off the list and then whatever uh, you're left with is probably the right answer. Uh, right. But yeah, it's very hard to figure out behaviors in dinosaurs because we can't go back and look at them. Mm -hmm. So we have to be really creative in how we uh, look at dinosaur behavior and evolution. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. And sometimes we don't have all the answers. So that's kind of the fun part, but also really hard sometimes. And it also seems like it's a journey too. Like you start with an idea, you do a lot of testing or lots of thinking about it, and you you eventually get to something that maybe is you feel confident about. Um, yeah. But it takes some it takes some time. Exactly. So I started studying ankylosaurs back in two thousand six, and every time I think I've got them figured out, I come up with a new question, right? So, um, and I still have questions that I asked in 2006 that I can't answer yet because we just don't have the fossils for them. So yeah, and there might be things that I never figure out in my whole life, which is a little hard to think about, but, um, but it's fun. And it means you have to be really creative a lot of the time. So I have a question. What yes. would an armored dinosaur look like if it was made out of Play-Doh? Oh, well, what a great question, Chris, because I think we're going to do that today. Hey. Um, so we've got uh, armored dinosaurs. I have a couple of examples of armored dinosaur, uh, Play-Doh and Kylosaurs that I've colored. So we're going to, they're all going to be kind of white while I make them today, but this is what it could look like when you're all finished today, if you let it dry and if you want to color it, or maybe you've colored your pasta beforehand. So Victoria, we're can, you, some, can you bring that closer to the yeah, camera? Yeah, I'm going to bring it closer. How does that look? I know sometimes yeah, my, no, my video great. gets a little blurry if I get too close <laughs> to my poor old laptop. Um, so we're going to make some Play-Doh and Kyle stores. I've got two that I made. I made this one and my husband made the other one. Um, <laughs> so you can see a couple different ideas. So here's the other guy. It has a very fetching bow on its head, which I quite like. <laughs> so these are all just made with the, the Play-Doh and the... Um, different pasta shapes but like I said you can use beads or buttons anything that you can kind of stick into play-doh that looks kind of like lumps and bumps and spikes um so ankylosaurs are really cool because they have this really weird thing going on in their skeleton where they have bones that grow in their skin so if you look at your skin we don't have any bones on the top of our skin right we have bones kind of inside if you look at your arm you can feel your bones really inside there but ankylosaurs actually have a layer of bones kind of in their skin, kind of in the same place where our hairs grow out from or where you sweat from. So instead of having hair or sweat, they have bones, which is super weird. There's a couple of animals today. I wanted to show one example of an animal that does the same thing today that has bones in its skin. Um, they have a special name, they're called osteoderms. And if you've ever seen an armadillo, I have a real armadillo shell in my house because I think they're cool. Um, so armadillos, this is the shell of an armadillo and these are bones that grew in their skin. So this is where the kind of the, the skin, the sort of orangey, horny skin is still on top of it. And then these are the bones themselves. You can see there's some segments. It's a little hard to see on my computer, but they've got little bumps in there. Those are all the little individual bones. And so then inside, you know, would have been the, the armadillo's like rib cage and its legs and its backbone. So they have this armor around their body that helps protect them. And ankylosaurs, uh, I've got my, I've also got my like tickle trunk of ankylosaur toys here. So I'm going to pull a couple of them out. Um, yeah, yeah. Ankylosaurs take that to an extreme where they've got bones in their skin, but they come in all kinds of interesting shapes, like different spikes and bony plates. Some of them have this tail club on the end of their tail. And chylosaurs are also usually very fat. So I'm going to get a couple out so that we can have some examples to look at. There's different kinds of ankylosaurs you can choose to make today. Maybe you'll make one, maybe you'll make more than one. So there's two main types of ankylosaurs. There's ankylosaurs that have a blob of bone on the end of their tail, a tail club. And then there's ankylosaurs that have a tail that tapers to a tip and doesn't have the big blob of bone on their tail. So those are the two main types. Both of them are very fat. <laughs> They're very fat, round, or round dinosaurs with short little legs. Kind of um, like armadillos too. 
they look kind of like armadillos too. Yeah, they're kind of wide and low to the ground. You see they've got that nice kind of wide profile. The ones that don't have a tail club often have very big spikes on their sides and on the front of their shoulders. And they tend to have a little bit of a longer face. And the ones with tail clubs tend to have kind of lower like bony plates. They're very kind of like low heels, not quite as spiky always. And they have kind of shorter, rounder faces. I'll just sort of like put him up here. And they have like little horns on the back of their head too, versus a kind of long stem. And the longer spikes would just discourage people, the other dinosaurs from eating? It. Yeah, so animals today that are very spiky are usually little animals that would get swallowed whole by a predator. And having spikes makes it really hard to swallow you whole. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why ankylosaurs are so spiky because even the big dinosaurs could not swallow them whole. Mm -hmm. But they probably were a very good adaptation for avoiding being eaten. <laughs> um, because even a big predator like a T-Rex probably doesn't want to get a big mouthful of spikes right into its mouth. So, um, and it makes them a little bit crunchier and it makes it harder for small predators to attack them because they have all of this armor protection. So armor can serve a lot of different functions, but the big one is defense and protection from being eaten. So ankylosaurs, once they grew up and they had all of their armor, they were probably really hard to eat as adults. As babies, they were born without their armor, so babies probably were really easy to snack on if you were a very small ankylosaur without any armor and you're very round and you can't run very fast. Um, probably very tricky. So I'm going to tip my screen down a little bit so you might not be able to see as much of my face, but this way we'll be able to see what I'm doing with my hands a little bit better. So I'm going to just do that. I'll try to keep my face mostly visible. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take my ball of dough this is kind of big, so I'm going to take about half of this dough and have maybe like a fist-sized piece. And <clears throat> we're going to start making an ankylosaur. So if you want to take, uh, kind of, you know, you can make a smaller one if you want. I'm going to make a pretty big ankylosaur just so you guys can see what I'm doing and I can put lots of different um, armor onto it. So first we're going to make their kind of squishy body. So if you've got like a nice big ball of dough, we're going to pinch off a couple of chunks that can become the legs. So we're going to pinch off maybe some pieces. Oh, they're a little uneven. Here we go. So a couple of little pieces, maybe about this big. And those will become the legs. Oh, I'm going to pull it back this way. So yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I always get it like reversed when I'm doing this because <laughs> it feels like the wrong direction to move them. Right. Okay, so we've got some little, <clears throat> some little legs. We're going to keep it really simple. I'm going to work on the body, though. The body is a little bit trickier. So I'm going to try to roll it into kind of like a big flat circle. I'll just let everyone catch up for a second. And then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of pinch the head and pinch the tail. Now if you want to make the tail and the head separately and then stick them back on, you can do that too. But I find for me, I'm a little bit better at it if I sort of pinch them and pull them out. Um, and then I stick the legs on afterwards. So I'm going to pinch, so ankylosaurs have a pretty small head on a pretty short neck. So actually this is going to be pretty close in size to this guy here, I think, by the end. So we're going to do a little short, fat head <laughs> right here at the front. And we're just going to make it really rough at the beginning, and then we can kind of smooth it out um, at the end. So just this kind of funny little head, just like that. And then we're going to... And the great thing about Play-Doh is you could, if you don't like it, you can go back and try it again. And you know what? I did that a couple of times the first time I tried this to figure out exactly how I wanted to do it. Yeah. Now I'm sort of pulling out a tail. I can't probably make the tail quite as long as I want to because it doesn't always work very well. So you can make it nice. They actually have pretty nice long tails. Uh, we might have to make a little bit of a shorter tail just so it works with the Play-Doh. And are you going to have the club on the end? I think I'm going to make a clubbed one. You can choose to make a non-clubbed one. I'm going to make a clubbed one because I like them a lot and I think it's really fun. <laughs> so you want to make sure that there's enough Play-Doh that you can stick a tail club onto at the end. So I think mine is starting to look pretty good. So it looks a little bit silly right now, but he's going to look really good in a little bit. <laughs> and I'm going to kind of smooth him out a little. I might roll him in my hands a little bit. I'm going to sort of fix up the head a little bit so it looks nice and smooth. And you know, you're just going to kind of play around with it a bit until it's a nice 
um, funny ankylosaur shape that you're happy with. Let's see. And I'm noticing, Victoria, that the tail is about half, like about two, two times as long as the head. Like I think that's pretty good. You can make it longer if you want to. I think for me, I'm going to keep it not too long just so that it sort of stays in a nice tail shape here. Yeah. So you're going to wind up, so this is kind of looking at your ankylosaur. Boop, boop, I'm going to squish them down a little bit. So this is going to be the top of our ankylosaur. We've got a tail kind of pinching off at the end here. And you've got a little head, a little round head at the top. So I'll just kind of hold that so everyone can see. Can you turn it around just to see that because it's flat, a bit flat, right? A bit flat, yeah. So you can see when I put them down, I made them a little bit flat. <laughs> And he's got his little head and a long tail. He's very cute already. You they do look pretty cute already. <laughs> Mine has a couple of little dimples and wrinkles. I'm not going to worry about that too much because we're going to put pasta on top. Um, but if you want to make it really smooth, that's OK, too. You can take your time and make it really smooth. I'm just going to roll up four little feet. So um, in Kylosaurus, they have pretty short, stubby legs. I found when I was making my ankylosaurs that it was easiest to just make some circles <laughs> and put them under the ankylosaur because they're going to get a little bit squished. So they're not going to be super accurate little legs. And I just rolled them into circles. So I'm going to roll four little circles. So just to this, recap what I've been doing, I about, rolled... The sizes are similar? Yeah, so that the sizes are pretty similar. If they're not totally the same, that's okay. But we're going to make four little circles. I think they're pretty close. Sometimes I'm not very good at making them exactly even. Mm. Okay, so by this point we, we sort of rolled our ankylosaur ball, we pinched a little head and then a slightly longer tail and then we kind of squished him down a little so he was a bit flat. And then we rolled four legs, <laughs> not very anatomically accurate legs, but they are going to work just fine for this guy. <laughs> And then we're gonna, you know, you can just kind of line them up if you want and then smush your ankylosaur down onto them or you can tip them over and stick them on like this. I'm actually probably just gonna kind of line them up and then squish them down onto them. There, stuff like that. And then, ta-da! <laughs> now he has an ankylosaur with legs. And you might need to sort of flip them over and sort of squish them on a little bit so that they stick on nice and, and firmly. I'm gonna turn around so you can see what I'm doing. It's just gotten cuter. Now he's very, very cute. <laughs> very, very cute. So sometimes the legs fall. I, I had one where the leg fell off a little bit, but I think that, you know, after a while, they'll kind of squish down because you'll be sort of put, poking at him and everything. So don't worry if the legs start to fall off a little bit. Um, if you really like your ankylosaur and one leg falls off, you can always glue it on later. So <laughs> do dinosaur surgery. Dinosaur surgery, that's right. Uh, it's just like a real paleontologist. Sometimes the bones break a little bit and you have to use mm. some special glues and put them together. Yeah. All right, so now the fun part, in my opinion, is we're going to put some armor on this ankylosaur. So ankylosaurs have lots of different armor shapes. I'm going to put some of these guys out so that you can get some inspiration. I always have to move this guy back a little. I like this nice, really spiky guy. <laughs> Here's another one with big spikes right on the shoulders. So we have lots of different armor shapes. They have different armor shapes depending on the species. And they also have different armor shapes on different parts of their body. So a lot of them have little horns on the back of their skull, on the back of the head. Uh, they often have rings, um, sort of like half rings, like a necklace on their neck. And then most ankylosaurs have pairs of osteoderms, so they're symmetrical. If you, if you drew a line down the center of your ankylosaur, it will have pairs of osteoderms on each of those sides. So they don't just get them randomly all over. If you want to make a random ankylosaur, that's totally fine too. If you want to make it a little more accurate, we're going to put them in kind of rows and pairs of, of osteoderms. So that's what I'm going to do so that we have one that looks pretty close. I'll just show you what I mean by that, where we've got mostly rows. So I do, so this particular guy gave a little bit of armor right on the neck with a bow tie pasta and then I have little pairs of osteoderms going down the back. And then I colored it rainbow because I thought look, that looked pretty. So you can do that too later on if you want. All right, so I've got a bunch of different pasta shapes. I'm going to lay a couple shapes out in front of me. 
this was really fun buying pasta for this because it's cool to like pick out different shapes. So I bought things like I took some spaghetti and just broke the spaghetti up into some some pokey bits. Got some penne pastas that I thought might be interesting and rigatonis. I like these bow tie pastas. Um, and then for the armor, I think what works really well actually are just simple macaroni shapes. I'm just gonna put a couple there. These are regular macaronis, like in craft dinner. And I also really like shell pastas. I think the shells work really well for ankylosaurs. So this is where you can be kind of creative. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put some pasta on, but you don't have to do exactly what I'm doing. You can use different shapes uh, and different patterns. You can be really creative. If you want to look up some pictures of ankylosaurs on the internet, you can sort of see what they have there. Um, so I'm going to make a, an ankylosaur that has a tail club. So I think I'm going to use, let's see, my husband used a bow tie pasta when he was making one the other day as a demonstration. So he used a bow tie pasta, which I thought was pretty cool. I'm gonna try using, I think I'm gonna use this rigatoni pasta. So he's got like a really wide tail club. So I'm gonna stick that on there. This might take a little, whoops, I already dropped it. <laughs> this might take a little bit of work getting the tail to stick on. You might have to kind of fold it over a little bit. Or like wrap it around. And wrap it around. This is probably the hardest one to put on. Let's see. And it really makes you think about how hard it must be to have a big blob of bone at the end of a long tail in the real animal, the non-Plato version of this animal. Okay, that looks nice. mostly okay, I would say. So that's his nice wide tail club made out of rigatoni. So <laughs> very anatomically accurate ankylosaur. All right, the maybe, other thing that- Maybe might, might not be the best in battle, but, but it would- That's right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I really like this one because it's nice and wide. A lot of ankylosaurs have a very round tail club, but there's a few that have a really wide tail club like this that look almost like a, like a, like an ax or something like that, mm. which is pretty cool. So let's see. So the other thing that I like to do is I like to give the ankylosaur some eyebrows because they often have these little like horns over the eyes. Let's see if I've got a good example of one. Um, this particular guy, he's got, this is an ankylosaurus. You've got horns right behind the eye, right there, and they usually have kind of an angry eyebrow above the eye. So I like to use the macaronis to give them sort of angry eyebrows, preferably eyebrows. That works too. <laughs> so I'm going to put two little macaronis there. And I have a really good trick. If you want to figure out how to put eyes on your ankylosaur or a nose, I took the macaroni piece and I took the, uh, the sort of circular end and I just pushed that in and made a little eye that way. And I also did that for his nose at the front. So I'll hold that up a little closer. Oh no, we lost one of his eyebrows. So now he has a little eyebrow and an eye. And I'm going to fix the other eyebrow that just fell. <laughs> oh, so you're just putting, you're putting it in as an like to indent into yeah, the... Yeah, just make a little indent um, for the eye. You could also use a pencil, mm -hmm. or if you have a big enough face, you could use a, a pasta to make an eyeball as well. So now let's make some armor on this guy. And I think I'm going to mostly use some shell pastas, maybe some macaronis. I'm going to give him one bow tie pasta on his neck to be the neck armor. So we're going to put that guy right there. That looks pretty good. I'm going to hold it up a little bit closer because I know it's very white on the screen. <laughs> and then we're just going to go and put some shell pastas in, in pairs. So there's two right behind it, two pairs. There's some more shell pastas in here. And this is the pretty fun part because you can just be really creative. And I just kind of stick them in as we go down the back. And they also go onto the tail. So this is looking pretty good so far. I really like ankylosaurs because they're so fat. They're just really fun to like make out of clay because they look really cute. So Victoria, while you're doing that, um, there's a question of how did you color the pasta in your other example? Oh, that's a great, I knew I would get a question about that. So after this had dried a little bit, I actually sat and I have these really fun like brush markers and I just colored in the pastas um, with markers. So you could do that with like Crayola markers 
Um, you could use paint. Um, some people asked if you could dye them in advance. I haven't tried that. I don't know if that would make them too wet or different shapes because it would almost be like hugging them. Um, one, of, one of our guests today, uh, Adina, said that they they dyed their pasta with food coloring. Oh, today, cool. So that's really cool. So you'll have to let us know how it. that goes. Yeah, yeah, I had not tried doing that. I'm using a couple of macaronis now to squish in along the side just to give some different shapes. Do, do, do. It's really fun squishing these in, I have to tell you. So Adina says, uh, we put them in a Ziploc bag with food coloring on the day before. Oh, that's nice. a really good idea. Yeah. See, I Thank always learn things that. from this too. Yeah. <laughs> People get even better ideas than I could come up with. I love it. Everyone is so creative. I can't wait to see people's ankylosaurs too. I really hope that you guys will share some with us because it's really fun to see. So I yeah. let my ankylosaur dry all the way before I, I colored it, but I think you could also color it while he's still a bit squishy if you're just coloring the pastas because they're nice and hard. So that shouldn't be too bad. So I've got a couple, let's see, I've got some spaghettis here. So um, if you're making an ankylosaur that, and you want it to have really big spikes on the side, that's kind of like what I did with the one I made in advance. The way that I made these big spikes are that I took spaghetti, just simple spaghetti. This might be spaghettini actually, but anyway, thin spaghetti. Um, and I broke it up a little bit and I broke them. I sort of grabbed a clump. Uh, I'm gonna make these a little smaller actually. I, I grabbed a clump and then I stuck them into the side. So that's how I made some of the spikes along the side. So we're gonna put a couple spikes in this guy just for fun, even though he might not have had really big spikes on the side. And if you make them big enough, they'll go in nice and deep and they won't fall out. Because I didn't make mine deep enough last time and they keep falling out, which is very sad. Because he said earlier that they would either have the tail club or big spikes on the side, but this, but this one can have both. This one's gonna have both because why not? He's yeah, made out of Play-Doh, so. <laughs> Um, and you know, we, what we're learning now is that some ankylosaurs, like the one that I named, the one on my shirt actually, which we named Zool a couple of years ago, um, actually had really big spikes on its bum. So it didn't have huge spikes on its shoulders, but it does have pretty big bum spikes. So maybe this one's going to be like Zool and have some big bum spikes. So let's see what else we've got. So I think I'm actually getting pretty close to filling up my ankylosaur with armor here. Um, one really neat thing about ankylosaurs is that they've got the big armor plates, like these big pastas that we put on the back, but in between all of those big armor pieces, um, the big plates and spikes are like thousands of tiny, tiny, tiny little osteoderms. We give them a special name called ossicles, and they're like maybe two or three millimeters wide, and they basically cover the whole dinosaur. Um, and protect all of the spaces in between those big bones. So they really, it's almost like chain mail. They're really well protected all over their body. All right, I think I, I wonder actually, actually with Victoria, I wonder with that if you could like, prior to putting the posture, if you like put little, like using uh, a pencil or like a textured. You know what you could probably do? Let's try it. I don't know if it'll work as well on my salt dough because sometimes the salt dough is a little more coarse, but maybe you could take spaghettis uh -huh. and just kind of poke around. Actually, that looks pretty cool. Give it some texture. Give it some texture and some scales. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to do this a bit and then I'll show you guys up close. This actually looks pretty cool. That was a really good suggestion. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. It's so fun to just experiment and play with things. Mm. All right, so that's my pretty much finished up in Hylosaur. Let's see if you can see the little dots that I put yeah. in with the spaghetti. He's got his little macaroni eyebrows and eyes. When we look at him from the top, he's got spikes coming out the side and he's got his rigatoni tail club. So this is like a pretty good Play-Doh ankylosaur, I would say. And Not as you were mentioning before, there's one side is similar to the other side. So. Yeah, one, so he's mostly symmetrical. He's got his one tail club at the end and his one pasta at the front for his neck armor. I'm gonna see if I can put some little horns on his head right behind his eyes. I'm gonna make those out of spaghetti. <laughs> Just a couple of little horns, because I think they look really cute. They almost look like a little bit like ears, I guess, this way, but that's close enough. There we go. That looks pretty good. All right, they get really hard to pick up once you put spaghetti on. <laughs> so there you go. That's what he looks like from the front. 
a nice wide ankylosaur with spikes all around, a tail club. You can also have an ankylosaur that does not have a tail club, and maybe it's even spikier. Maybe you use bigger armor pieces, bigger pastas. Uh -huh. um, yeah. It's kind of kind of like what you were talking about earlier, being the scientist. Is it experimenting and like testing things out and seeing? Exactly. Yeah, and we tested out putting little scales and ossicles on with yeah. little bumps. Um, yeah, so there, that's an ankylosaur. I don't know. Do we want to make a second one? Would people like to well, ask me some questions? Well, we're at we're at the end of the official session. The official session. Well, that's great. So what I'm um, thinking is. Um, well, if anyone needs to go, it's a uh, little after 11.30 now. If anyone needs to go, feel free to. Um, though definitely send us a picture of your uh, dinosaur. And, um, and Kim, maybe we can stay on Facebook Live just in case there's anyone there who would like to hear some questions or put some questions forward. Um, so if there's anyone out there in Facebook Live land or in the Zoom room here, if you have any questions for Victoria about um, there's so many interesting things that you brought forward, Victoria. Oh, thank you. I know I, I rattled on a lot. I really like Inkylosaur, so I'm really happy to answer questions. Maybe one thing that I can share just as people are finishing up their Inkylosaurs mm -hmm. is that we found the first bones of an Inkylosaur in British Columbia. Well, I, I shouldn't say we found them. We identified the first bones from an Inkylosaur in British Columbia just a couple of weeks ago myself. Uh, and my colleagues David Evans at the Royal Ontario Museum and Derek Larson, who's now at the Royal BC Museum as our collections manager, and my colleagues Lisa Buckley and Matthew Baverick. Um, we looked at some bones that were found in 1930 that had been sort of overlooked in museum collections, and they actually turned out to be from an ankylosaur. They were some backbones and ribs uh, from up in northeastern BC. They're even older than Buster, for people who were around when we drew Buster on the first session. Uh, Buster is about 67 million years old, and these bones were about 95 million years old, so even older. And we also have lots of ankylosaur footprints in British Columbia, so not a lot of bones, but lots of footprints. So, Victoria, we have a question. What are the bony, this is from Shannon on Facebook. Um, what are the bony armor called? Ah, they are called osteoderms. Maybe I can type it into the chat. I can type to everybody in the chat, right? I'm going to uh, type it in. Osteoderm. One hand. One hand. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so osteo means bone and derm means skin. So it's a really good name. It means skin bone, basically, which is a little bit gross, but very accurate for what it is. <laughs> Thankfully, so where, we do not have osteoderms. Right. <laughs> no, if we did, we would be used to it. it would, That's true. I mean, armadillos probably don't mind that they have osteoderms. Yeah, totally. So. <laughs> um, where were those bones found? What collection? Okay, so they were part of the Geological Survey of Canada's collection, and now they're part of the Canadian Museum of Nature's collection in Ottawa. So uh, they were found in 1930 um, while the, uh, this geologist from the Geological Survey was, you know, surveying across Canada. He was mapping the geology of northeastern British Columbia. And these bones were found in a place called along the Pine River, which is up in northeastern BC, kind of near Chetland. And so David and Derek and I went up there last spring in May of 2019 to see if we could find the spot where the bones had been collected. Uh, we didn't find any more bones in that area, but we did find an ankylosaur footprint or two, which was pretty cool. So we brought back one of the footprints to be part of the Royal BC Museum collection. Mm, great. And I imagine you'll go back up there. Yeah, I think it would be really fun to go back up there. Tumblr Ridge and Chetwind, all of that area in northeastern BC has a lot of potential to find dinosaur fossils and to find dinosaur fossils that are older than most of the ones that you would find elsewhere in Canada. So they give us some really interesting new information about the evolution of dinosaurs and um, uh, yeah, how dinosaurs were changing through time in British Columbia. Ah, great. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. Oh, thank you. And I really hope where people will share some ankylosaurs. What's that? I said, I really hope people will share their Play-Doh ankylosaurs with us. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And also, if um, I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but uh, Victoria was the first uh, episode of RBCM at Home Kids. 
And then about halfway through, uh, Victoria did another one on, Victor on di dinosaur tracks. Mm -hmm. So if you can't get enough of dinosaurs, you can go back and see those uh, sessions as well. But it's, uh, it's always such a pleasure to have you uh, here, Victoria. Thank you so much. One more question actually from Shannon. Okay, great. You talked about the ankylosaurs looking different. Would the different ones be alive in the same era? Oh, that's such a great question. So yes, in a lot of places in North America, we there was usually like one tail-clubbed ankylosaur and one non-tail-clubbed ankylosaur. The very fancy names for them, the non-tail-clubbed ones are called nodosaurid ankylosaurs. And then the tail-clubbed ones have a very confusing name. They're called ankylosaurid ankylosaurs. <laughs> so nodosaurs and ankylosaurids. And in a lot of places in North America, there was like at least one or two species of ankylosaurid and one or two species of nodosaurid. Um, but they don't necessarily live uh, in the same ecosystem everywhere in the world. So nodosaurids um, weren't usually living in the same environment as the tail clubbed ones in, say, Mongolia and China. We only find tail clubbed ones in Mongolia and China. And the non-tail clubbed ones uh, lived in more places on the planet. So we find them even in Antarctica, uh, in Europe, um, in all kinds of like all kinds of weird places. My favorite is that there's one in Antarctica. Its name is Antarctopelta, which means the Antarctic Shield. A lot of ankylosaurs use Pelta as part of their name instead of Saurus. Saurus means lizard, but Pelta means little shield which is a really great name for an ankylosaur. So you get, you get lots of different little um, something peltas as the species names for ankylosaurs. Great. Well, thanks everyone on Facebook Live uh, for joining. Thanks everyone in the Zoom room um, and we hope to see you next Wednesday. Uh, and also maybe in the, you mentioned Der Derek uh, Larson as the new collections manager. Hopefully you have him on at some point. Uh, to say hello to everyone and and maybe do another dinosaur activity or or fossil activity. So. Yes, okay. I'm sure he would love to. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Victoria, and thanks everyone for for joining in. We'll we'll stop the Facebook live feed. The final look at the, <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful and. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs>